I'm a clinical assistant professor of dermatology and pediatrics at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. I'm also the founding director of the Chicago Integrative Eczema Center, and I am a proud board member for the National Eczema Association. The treatment of atopic dermatitis is pretty complex and for better or for worse, and I think honestly, mostly for better, we have had a lot of new additions into that therapeutic toolbox, if you will, in the last couple of years and many more to come. Apparently there are over 100 new treatments in development right now. So for a very long time, it was sort of stagnant. We didn't have a lot of options for our patients and their families, but now we have a lot. So this is a rapidly changing area. And I ask that everybody kind of stay tuned because there's so many things happening and so many changes that I really think that the approach that we have used for more than 50 years is actually going to change because now we have some new options. But in general, the first thing we're trying to do for every patient is make sure that they have good education. We wanna make sure people understand everything that we understand about the condition. We want people to get a sense of what are the things that can aggravate it or the triggers as we call them and how to avoid those. We want to emphasize good basic skincare first. So that would mean gentle bathing, good moisturization. These things for some patients, if they're mild enough, that literally might be all that they need. And that's a huge, huge win if we can get patients better without any prescription medicines. I think almost everybody views that as the way, that's what we want. But when it is not enough, and of course for my patients, that's never really enough because that's why they're being sent to me. Most of my patients have already seen several other practitioners and have tried a number of different approaches. So the first step tends to be using topical steroids. And there's a little bit of controversy there because I think we're seeing some growing sentiment against topical steroids in the world. but. I'll defend them only so far as to say that they are very, very reliable. They help almost everybody. They're very accessible because they're inexpensive and most people can get them either through insurance or even without insurance, they're, they're affordable. And then the last thing is that I truly think that they can be used safely. So if we're careful about the duration of use and the, the potency of the steroid, most everybody can use them pretty safely. The problem is that for many patients, they are not enough they are using them over and over and over and they say gosh every time i stop i flare up again but my doctor keeps saying don't use it all the time so I'm, I'm stuck i don't know what to do if i use it i'm better but then as soon as i stop i'm bad so i don't understand how i don't how i couldn't use it all of the time so this is a real problem and this is the general place where i inherit patients people are sort of stuck here Again, for some people, and maybe even if you took all patients with atopic dermatitis in the world, maybe it would even be the majority of patients. They could use some topical steroids from time to time, maybe three or four days or a week, and then they could take many days or many weeks off. That I really think for almost everyone should be a safe and very efficient way to use them. Uh, and for those people, they're generally not tuning into something like this. Maybe they've used some steroids for a little bit and then they're fine for a long time and, and they're not worried. But it's really for the, the patients and the families where they find that they're needing them all the time. What we get worried about is this condition that again, is still somewhat controversial and your the clinical provider that you see may or may not endorse this. Although I, I truly think there is something here and we're working right now very hard behind the scenes to get more diagnostic criteria, to get this to be better understood and better acknowledged by members of the community. And it's this concept called topical steroid withdrawal, or maybe more specifically, topical steroid withdrawal syndrome. I like to add that S because topical steroid withdrawal can just be a physiologic thing. If you use steroids for a long time and you stop, you tend to flare up, but that's very different than this syndrome, which can go on for weeks, months, and honestly, even years in some patients, where now the skin has really been altered by the use of topical steroids. And while there are still many unanswered questions, it's certainly something on a lot of people's minds and some of the patients really suffer. And in general, they suffer in a different and many times a more pronounced way than the underlying condition. So if the eczema was bad, topical steroid withdrawal syndrome can be far worse. So we're really trying to balance these risks and benefits. Now, to help us, we have a lot of different approaches that do not rely on steroids. So it is definitely a false dilemma when people say, well, you're either gonna suffer or you're gonna use steroids because now we have many things. 
everything from our non-pharmacologic treatments, and that would include things like moisturizers and dilute bleach baths and wet wrap therapy, where we put damp garments on the skin to help really cool it and to super hydrate it and protect the skin overnight. Uh, including things like phototherapy, where we use the healing power of light, typically a, a type of light called narrowband ultraviolet B. So we have a lot of things that we can do outside really of, of sort of the prescription medication realm. But then even within the prescription medication realm, we have a couple of real breakthroughs and game changers. I would say the first and largest breakthrough came in March of 2017 in the United States, and that's a medication called Dupilumab. That's an injectable medicine. It uses a human antibody that actually can block the inflammation signaling. So it's, it's a humanized monoclonal antibody uh, that blocks IL-4 and IL-13, two inflammatory signals in the body. And in so doing, it can be not an immunosuppressant, not a steroid, right? It's none of those things, but it can really help with the itch and inflammation signal and really, really change patients' lives. I've seen that over and over and over with Dupilumab. So that's been wonderful. Just in the past year for adults, we have a new uh, kind of a cousin of it, a different medicine called Trelokinumab. It works very similarly and uh, it's quite comparable in many ways. What's nice about the biologic class, these are called biologics, they are relatively safe and they don't require blood monitoring and they don't they don't have a lot of the scary side effects that we might have seen with older immunosuppressive agents which we used to have to use for really severe patients that would be things like cyclosporin or methotrexate or mycophenolate those medicines can be very effective but they have a whole bunch of side effects they require blood work and monitoring and so on the other thing that's been really exciting is that we have a new category of topical agents that, again, just came out in the past year or so. And these are the JAK inhibitors, Janus kinase inhibitors. We right now have one in the United States, but there are others in development, and that's called ruxolitinib. What's really neat about this is this is a non-steroidal, powerful anti-inflammatory and anti-itch. So for many of my patients, I find that I can even go back and forth between a topical steroid and then a Janus kinase inhibitor that we have. Uh, of course, the older medicines that were distant cousins, again, non-steroidal medicines, were our calcineurin inhibitors. And that includes tacrolimus and pimacrolimus. And those are really nice because again, they're non-steroidal and they can be used pretty safely for patients. And then in 2016, we got another member of that family and that was chrysoboral. So we actually now have four non-steroidal topical anti-inflammatory prescription medicines in the United States. And I think that's really exciting. So again, anytime someone says it's either steroids or the highway, we know that's not true. There are other non-steroidal medicines. So a number of different approaches that we can use. And the hard part for us is trying to figure out how to put them all together. The most recent addition to our armamentarium are the oral JAK inhibitors. We mentioned the topical JAK inhibitor. That's really pretty amazing and pretty powerful. But there's recently been two oral ones that have been released in the US and a third released globally. And those are called upatacitinib and abrocitinib. And those are among the most powerful things I've ever seen. So for the super, super, super severe cases, they can really turn things around. But those are for a pretty specialized group and you really kind of have to climb that ladder and get to that point. So I won't spend too much time on that here, but they can be game changers for those appropriate patients. But really the art of this is trying to find where can we put the right plan together for a patient. How do we build what I call my eczema action plan or, or therapeutic regimen that meets the needs of the patient and family, that is effective, that is safe, that is affordable. And I call this, really, I kind of summarize this by saying we have to, to cover or clear these three hurdles. The first hurdle, hurdle is that can we get you clear of the condition? And some patients I, I inherit, they're so severe, we can't even seem to get their skin clear even for a minute. So that's the first hurdle. Usually we can get people clear. The second hurdle is can we keep them clear safely? So we really wanna make sure we're doing something that's not gonna result in skin damage or systemic problems. And that is really a lot of the art trying to find out how do we minimize the exposure to some of the dangerous things and use some of the things that are a little safer, but they tend to be less effective. So there's that trade-off. And then the third hurdle is also really important. And that one is, can you keep it up? So that's really critical because keeping up a regimen is a huge key. If we have the perfect regimen for you and the perfect medicine, but you're not able to use it for any reason because it feels gross or it burns and stings, or you can't get it covered by insurance uh, or perhaps some other reason, 
you know, we had a problem with it, then that is not going to be usable. So this constant communication, this constant refining and honing of the regimen is really critical. I don't, I almost never have the same thing we started someone on. They don't finish on that. We're always changing it, altering it, modifying it. Uh, and we're doing that really to be dynamic with their needs. All that being said, I think there are a tremendous amount of resources out there and it can be overwhelming. So a big part of it is also trying to focus on the key things that matter because we could go and talk for not just minutes, but we could talk for hours about the role of diet, about the role of environment. Does having a dog really make or break eczema? What about exercising? What about being hot and sweaty versus being cold and dry air? All these things can play an important role. And for some people, they really can be the critical role. But what we find is that for most patients, if we are able to really try to find out a good therapeutic approach, many of these other issues can kind of fall down in importance and I think really be very freeing because a lot of times patients and families are looking for a root cause. They want one thing or just a couple of things that are driving it. Is it food? Is it the environment? Is there something out there that's doing this? Can we make a change that would stop it? And I agree, that would be the best of all. And there's no doubt for some people, they are able to find a thing or things that they can change. But the truth is they're not here. They don't come and find me because they already figured it out a long time ago. If we're able to find something like that, they tend to be found very early. And so for patients who've been going on for months or years, typically we're not that lucky. I wish we were, and it doesn't mean we have to stop looking, but generally what it means is it's worth it to us, I think, to get things under control, because sometimes when things are out of control, you can't even tell what's making it better, or what's making it worse. And this is an important threshold effect where if the skin is really angry, even the slightest perturbation can make things go crazy. Once we're in a better place, once we're sleeping better and the skin is under better control and the barrier is healed, then it can really allow us appropriate insight. We can say, aha, you know, it turns out that now I can eat this fruit or I can now do this exercise or this sport and I'm okay. This wasn't one of the key things, but maybe we will find other things. You know, gosh, it does turn out that when I sleep over by my friend's house, it really does flare up right after. And I wonder if it's something with the pillows or the blankets or something in their home. So we need to look at that. And that in and of itself can be incredibly gratifying to find out that now we can see what's going on because we've gotten the skin better. I hope that's really helpful and it's really designed to give hope and encouragement not to be overwhelming in any way. I know there's a lot here, but at the very least, we've begun the first step of our journey. We are lucky that there are many non-pharmacologic, meaning approaches, treatments that don't require a medicine per se, that can really help with atopic dermatitis. And we use these all the time in clinical practice, sometimes by themselves, more commonly along with pharmacologic or medical treatments. And there are so many, I wrote a paper on it a few years ago, that's several pages long of just listing them and discussing them and talking about the evidence for them. But these include things like wet wrap therapy, which is where we have a patient take a bath or a shower, put on either a medicine or a moisturizer, and then take a wet layer of clothing. So for babies, it might be a thin onesie. We dunk it in the sink and wring it out just so it's damp. For older kids and adults, maybe it's a pair of long underwear, uh, and they can put that on damp and then put a nice dry layer over it. So maybe a sweatshirt and sweatpants so they don't get cold, but that cool and damp clothing, that fabric, and it can also be done with gauze or, or what we call tube garments, smaller, smaller garments that can cover just maybe arms or legs or a certain area or gloves. They put that moisture and coolness into the skin and they also push that moisturizer in. And doing this for a few hours or often we'll do it overnight for a few nights can really transform things. Other things that have been shown to be helpful that are not really prescription type medicines is using things like bleach baths. So dilute bleach baths probably do help a little bit. And what this tends to be is you, you take a, a cup of plain old bleach. We don't want any fabric softener or anything fancy in there, but just the sodium hypochlorite bleach. And you'd put on the order of a quarter cup, maybe as much as a half a cup in a bathtub full of water. So it's very dilute. It smells like a swimming pool. Really, you were chlorinating the water just like you might do if you go to a swimming pool. 
in general, it's very, very safe and well tolerated. The issue here is that we initially thought it was working because it was killing bacteria on the skin, but it turns out it's probably not. It's probably so dilute that it doesn't really work through antibacterial methods. It's probably helping through anti-inflammatory and anti-itch. And when we really look at all the studies, there's some mixed reviews. Some don't show much help. Some show some significant help, but we think that on balance, there probably is a little bit of help for some patients. And certainly that doesn't mean that for an individual patient, they might not have a great effect. And for other patients, it might not do much at all. So that's one of the hard parts. When you study a population, you sort of average everything. So you get a sense of does it work or not. But for an individual, I've had some patients say, this has changed my life. And other patients say, eh, didn't do much. So that's why sometimes we have to try things on an individual patient. We're not sophisticated enough yet to know if a specific thing will work for a specific patient. Hopefully one day we will get there. And the dream there is what we call precision or personalized medicine, but we're not there yet. Another powerful treatment that we use a lot is phototherapy. So typically this is done with a booth. It looks almost like a tanning booth, but it's not a tanning booth, it's different. Tanning booths use ultraviolet A light. Here we're really relying on something called narrowband ultraviolet B. And what's really wonderful about this is that it has almost all of the healing properties of the sun, but much, much less of the damaging property because you can go outside and sit in the sun, but that of course has a lot of damage, can do a lot of damage to your skin uh, and accelerate aging and also potentially increase your risk for skin cancer. But with UVB, it's filtered in a way that those risks are, are minimized and the therapy is, is really helped. So it helps with itch and inflammation. It also helps with the, the skin microbiome, the bacteria on the skin. It is sometimes difficult to access. You have to have a, a place nearby that can do it uh, or be able to get a unit at home, but that can be very, very powerful. And of course we have our moisturizers and there are so many wonderful moisturizers out there now. Many of them are what I like to call moisturizers and more. They have additionally ingredients. They're not just there to add water or help protect the skin. Some of them have antibacterial properties. Some of them actually have precursors to the skin barrier so they can actually help strengthen it and reinforce it. Uh, some of them have ingredients that can actually be somewhat anti-inflammatory. So we use a lot of these things and that's very, very exciting. And I also, in my practice, I take an integrative approach. So I'm always looking at botanicals, plant materials that can be helpful. So some of the natural oils that sometimes can be very helpful would include things like sunflower oil and coconut oil and hemp oil. Those are all ones that we can use usually topically, but in the case of hemp oil, actually taking some hemp oil by mouth, putting it into the diet, that can actually help. So there are of course many different things that we can do and many pathways we can go, but the most important thing is keeping hope because there are so many different options that almost, almost uh, impossible to really go through them all, which is a good thing. So when a patient comes in and says, I've tried, one, two, three, four, five, six things, I almost always have seven, eight, nine ready to go.